given that uh, Doug Walker of thatguywiththeglasses.com recently uploaded a top 20 list of his favorite films, I thought I'd take uh, the, the brief opportunity to uh, share my top nine films with you. Uh, well, with anyone who's interested. I have no idea why I chose top nine, but I suppose it does offer a whole, a rather original slant on the uh, top uh, film list. And also, uh, it would narrow down the list from a, a rather more unwieldy 20. In any case, uh, these are my top nine favorite films. Uh, here's hoping uh, we share a liking for a couple of them. Enjoy. Shot in Sydney, incidentally, and adapted from the novel by Stephen King, Salem's Lot deftly updates the vampire mythology into an urban present. James Cromwell stands out as an alcoholic priest who is fed the blood of Rutger Hauer's Barlow and is thus brought to the dark side in much the same way as Mina Harker from the original Dracula. The principal cast is uniformly excellent, capturing teen angst, faltering romance, and the shady happenings of a small town in an atmospheric yet inviting movie. Moreover, the direction, cinematography, and effects are all better than the normal standard of telemovies. The first and only cinema screened episode in an outstanding Swedish crime series, Before the Frost Trumps CSI uh, and any of its attempts at personal drama. Rooted in the Jonestown massacre of many decades back, the narrative is slow at first, but it does allow you to care for its characters. Morose Kurt, withdrawn daughter Linda, haughty cop Stefan, from the onset. The dynamic between Kurt and Linda, as their strange relationship thaws, is touching to watch. And the hints of division between Linda and friend Anna all give way to a gripping finale. The Kurt Wallander series, adapted from Henning Mankell's novels, would get even better by the fourth episode, but, alas, they were only televised, so I can't include them on this list. A little-known Russian gem by Andrei, uh, I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce the name, uh, The Return is a film that positively mourns its past and setting. Its subdued colors, brooding camera work, and somber mood all speak of the desolation that has settled over many in living in post-Soviet Russia. This angle is never mentioned explicitly, but Lavrinenko's tough love tyrant of a father and the hardened personas of Geren and Dobron Verov all suggest that nothing is infallible, whether it be a family or an empire. Smarter, slower, and just as ambitious as The Matrix, this Polish-produced film handles themes of virtual reality far more effectively. Directed by Mamoru Oishi of Ghost in the Shell fame, Avalon posits a virtual reality war game into which the youth of the underground retreat from the drab, sepia-toned boredom of the real world. Boasting stunning cinematography and a sublime musical score, the action scenes are sparse but stylish and always inventive. Malgozada Foremniak starring as a lone speck fighting to reach the fabled last level of Avalon, encounters two worlds, 
that question us at every turn. Is Ash's real world true? Can technology be more engaging than reality? If so, is it right to seek the former and ignore the latter? If you're looking for a hardcore action film, then steer away. But if you enjoy thoughtful films that aren't pretentious, then this is an ideal one for you. Avalon is complicated, but at the same time, simply good. As I've mentioned before, the omen works, even for atheists like me. And it works spectacularly. On top of its tense vibe, tight pacing, clever storytelling, and skillful performances by Peck and Remick, The Omen offered deaths that shocked and impressed us long before the likes of Friday the 13th and Saw came along. Well, except for that impalement scene. That always made me laugh. Brought to the screen by the Wachowski Brothers, this is the best comic book film that I've ever seen. What sets this film apart from many other dystopian dramas, aside from its rip-roaring fight scenes, compelling plot, and superb acting, are its sympathetic, very intimate portrayals of those living under fascist rule, and its morally ambigu ambiguous, cold yet charismatic hero in Hugo Weaving. The greatest Kaiju Ega film ever made. I'm not joking on this. If Cloverfield's single fault was that it focused too heavily on the humans and skimped on scenes of the monster, then Gamera 2 is everything that Cloverfield wasn't. Treating us to a wholly realistic monster brawl with everyone's favorite turtle, the suitmation, puppetry, and model work are all more than convincing. And the kaiju action is supported by fun, quirky, and likable characters. Additionally, Legion is, certainly, the most original kaiju since Biolant. Rather than playing it safe with another dragon or insect, the production team, Dae, showed true creativity in its formidable design for Gamera's foe. Simply put, Legion is a cool enemy for the coolest of the bunch. A silent film, yet still resonant today, Fritz Lang's breakout sci-fi entry was the source of many of the most iconic in Im images in cinema, including, most obviously, the classic design for C-3PO in Star Wars. Metropolis confronts the potential for harm present in both technology and rampant capitalism, and was an unforgettable experience for me as a kid. I've already devoted a two-part review to this Enki Bilal film, but I'll finish by saying that Immortal is beautiful and poignant, and can be impressive even when it flops in places. Well, there you have it. Those are my top nine favorite films. I'd love to hear what, what all of you think uh, about each of them. Um, I'm eager to read your comments. And if, if you have any suggestions for future film reviews or a cherished film of yours that you'd, you'd like me to see, uh, don't hesitate to drop me a line. Uh, thanks for listening or thanks for watching. Uh, see you later.